Hey, Mikey back here again from my sawdust filled shop. Um, what I'm going to do today is a short video. I've got a client that we put a kitchen in a few years ago, and um, they had a Fisher Bacal dishwasher, which is two drawers, um, and that had, I don't know, going on the blink or whatever. So they replaced it with a new dishwasher that has a single full height door. So they want me to make up a new panel. Uh, we had a shaker style drawer faces on the Fisher Pickel, and um, now they need one piece door, a full height door. So um, I got to whip one out today for her, and um, I'll, I figured maybe I'll make a video for you, all right? So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> I'm using poplar for the frame of the door, and I'm going to use some 3 8 uh, maple plywood to make the panel for it. So I'm going to walk you through the steps. I may not talk much, but um, you can see what's going on. I've just um, rough cut a couple pieces of poplar here. So I'm going to run across the joiner, then go cut them to size on the table saw. And then I'm going to go over to my shapers, which are already preset. I've got a zillion shapers in this shop. And I've got um, a few of them set up. They're dedicated just to do the stick and cope on different type of doors. And um, this one has a bead. It's a shaker style flat panel but the frame has a bead on it. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'll joint these. I'm going to go on the table saw and rip them to my widths and then cut them to length on the slider. And then I'm going to go over to the shapers and do the stick and cope. And then we'll run out the panel on the table saw or the slider. We'll put them together and then we're going to prime paint them in white. And then we'll put the finished color on to match her existing color. And um, there you go. So. One dishwasher panel coming up. Sheila's head, it's a bird, Sheila's head, B-Y-R-D, bird Sheila's head, and it kind of eliminates any tear out. Um, it's great if you've got to do something like um, bird's eye maple or spalted uh, woods or any kind of crotch material. Um, it works out really good. It can kind of cross the grain against the grain with um, very little or no tear out whatsoever. And on poplar like this, um, this stuff is pretty straight grained. Um, but you don't have to worry too much about it. 
Probably I could run this stuff in either direction on a regular joiner. But you can see here, see how the grain is going downward? You would want to be cutting this direction. If this is the cutter head, you would want to be passing your wood this way. The grain is going down. So it's not grabbing the points of the grain, all right? In other words, you see this is going down. The grain is going down here. So if you're coming with a cutter, you're grabbing into the points of that grain. And that is what causes tear out. But as you can see with my cutter here, they're nice and clean cut. There's no, no tear out whatsoever. Yeah, see again here, the grain is going downward here. If you can see the grain going down, I'll draw lines. This is kind of like the direction of the grain. So you would want to run this, through. if this is your cutter head here, you would want to run it in this direction, like this, across your cutter head, all right? You would not want to be coming this direction, because you see though, the, pretend those lines are my grain, I'm emphasizing a little bit, but if you were to go this direction across the cutter head, the cutter would be grabbing the grain this way and possibly tearing it out. But again, with the Shielitz bird head, that's not really an issue, so I don't have a problem. All right, I'm going to go over a table saw now, and um, we're going to rip it to size. But first, what I'll do, I'll, I'll show you that bird Shielitz head. All right, so here's what I'm talking about with the the bird Shielitz head. They're pretty sharp. See these little cutters? They're all individual cutters. They have four separate cutting edges. So when one, one edge gets cut or chipped or something, you can, um, you can always loosen up this Allen screw here and, re and rotate this, okay, and expose a new cutting edge. And once all four edges are used up and dulled, then you just take it off and replace it with another one. There's no sharpening of these, all right? But having this series of um, individual cutters and set on a spiral action, they're not straight across, that helps unbelievably on eliminating tear out. Okay, so let's go over to the table saw now. Make note of something here. 
notice I, I ripped these a couple times to turn them back and forth. Um, I did run them across the joiner, which I got a nice straight edge to start with. But uh, had I zoomed in on the cut as this was going through the table saw, you could tell this my material all comes in here kiln drying, all right? Uh, and this particular, this poplar, I buy oh, upwards of about 1,500 to 2,000 board feet every time I, I place an order. So it sits here, it could be sitting here anywhere from two or three months up to maybe a year or more, depending on how much poplar I'm using. And um, so at any rate, as I was ripping this, I, you pay attention to the kerf cut as it passes off the blade. And you, what, what you want to look, you want to see that board is closing up on the cut or moving open as it goes through the blade. That'll tell you that there is still just a little bit of movement in this wood. And um, I don't care who kiln dries your material, whatever. There's No matter what you do, how good you kiln dry material, there's always going to be some movement. It could be because even though they got it down to the right percentage as it came out of the kiln, it may have sat in their um, yard for maybe a couple days, weeks, months, or whatever before I purchased it. Um, and again, I'm buying it in the rough, so we're talking uh, rough planks anywhere from 11 to 14 inches wide. That's how much. I normally buy my poplar in what we call um, 10 and better. That, that means they're going to give me boards that I can get a clean 10 inches out of. So they're going to be anywhere from like 10 and a half on up, all right? So, and that's what I like. I like the wider boards um, for the purpose I mostly use poplar for. Uh, okay, so getting back to that, there is going to be slight movement. It's possible it sat here while sitting in my shop, and I keep it in the back of my shop against a wall um, where it's most stable. Um, I used to keep uh, lumber stacked by my overhead door, my old shop, where it came in just because it's the only place I had to store it. But that means every time I open my overhead door, um, you would be getting either cold air or hot air or moist air or dry air or whatever, and it would be constantly moving past that pile of material. And that could be causing expansion contraction as it absorbed or let off more or less moisture. Um, in this shop, when I bought this building, I purposely made my lumber racks in the back of the building, outside of the major airflow and all, um, so that it would remain more, it's in more stable environment rather than by a door or in a, a pattern of, uh, I mean, a, a section of the shop that's going to submit it to a lot of air movement, all right? Now, yes, we, you want to say, well, well, isn't air movement good for lumber? Yes, if you're air drying material um, that was not kiln dried, you, you stack it and you sticker it and you cover the top of it and you want air to move through, but that's not ideal for in a shop once everything's been kiln dry. Now you want, they brought it down to the proper moisture content, and you want to maintain it at that um, moisture content. So um, I'm blabbing on, and probably a lot of people say you talk too much, no? but there's a lot of people that don't know this stuff, and um, I'm targeting a lot of those people. So back to this. As I was cutting this through, I noticed the boards open just a little bit. In other words, they start to spread apart. That meant, even though I had made one straight cut, I cut these a little bit oversized, knowing there's going to be maybe a little bit of movement on it. And so that's why, with that 42-inch fence, the Beesmeyer fence here, that's long enough on a short board that this had got just a slight little bow, no more than the thickness of a dollar bill. But it was enough that I could see that one-eighth curve cut as it was coming out of the saw open up just a little bit. So. By recutting these back and forth a couple times with a 42 inch fence, I brought these back down to where they're perfectly straight again, all right? So, and um, I normally do that when I cut up my lumber. I'll rough cut all my sizes and then I'll leave them sometimes sit overnight. Because that, what you're doing, you're all one wide board, and by cutting them down in smaller strips, if there was any. Um, higher moisture content or a little stress in the wood, by rough cutting you're relieving that little bit of stress. Letting them sit for a couple hours or overnight is ideal and um, that will enable you to come back the next day or several hours later or whatever and recut or rejoin or whatever and make sure they're perfectly straight. Um, this is not real critical because it's like a door but it's being secured to a dishwasher. If it was going to be a door that's hanging I would be a little more concerned to make sure everything is perfectly stable as possible 
because the door is hanging on only one edge. So that, if there's any movement still in that wood, after I put the door together, it could cause the door to warp or something, or maybe a little cupping or bowing or something. So um, in this case where it's being secured to a dishwasher, all four corners are going to be secured and held, so that's not as critical. But it's a practice I hear too, whether I know there's going to be um, securing of it like a, a panel or the end panel of a cabinet or something, rather than just a freehand door. I, I, you practice these um, techniques, um, whether you're making doors or not. Uh, it just becomes second nature to you. So, all right. If you don't like all the talking, um, go back and fast forward <laughs> through what I just said. But at any rate, I gotta go to the slider now. Cut these the rough length. All right. You got everything. I'm not cutting my head off. Okay. Um, I make my um, my rails, which are the cross pieces, the top and bottom. I make those to an exact size, but my styles, which are the height of the panel or the door, I always make them an eighth of an inch larger, as well as making the width of my rails a sixteenth of an inch long. This allows me a six, I can rip a sixteenth of an inch off the finished panel after it's put together. Um, I'm making my panel an eighth of an eighth of an inch wider and higher than what I'm looking for. That allows me to, if, when I put it together with something slightly out of square or something, um, I can trim that off. Or when I'm clamping it, the clamp, the Jorgensen clamps on here, they'll sometimes make an imprint or indentation on the edge or something. It allows me to clear that off and have a nice edge. So I do make my doors and panels one eighth inch oversized. Okay, um, I've got my styles one eighth longer than I want. I got my rails cut the exact length, but a sixteenth of an inch wider than I want. Because there's going to be a sixteenth coming off the top of the door, a sixteenth off the bottom of the door, and a sixteenth on the left and right side of each style. So here we go. We're going to go into the, um, the, I call it the messed up room. Here's a cool gadget I made up. This is actually a push stick for pushing small styles and rails through my um, sticking machine. Um, if you have a short rail, this is just to push it through. And um, I made this up, it looks kind of cool. That was just to kind of take weight off of it and to make it look a little cooler. 
and I put grooves in here so when I'm pushing I'm getting a better grip. You ever see a push stick like that before? <laughs> ah, what the hell. short piece or a narrow piece that's um, sometimes I use the power feeder but for the most part this is what I'm talking about I'll use this thing to push a smaller piece through like this it's a great push stick for um, keeping your hands away from the cutter even though there is a guard over there a homemade guard all right this is what I've just done all right I did the um, coping on the ends here on that first machine over there that's dedicated to just doing, I've been using that for years. And if you saw that little um, sliding jig I made up, um, I probably run tens and tens of thousands of doors on that, all right? That does the um, coping on the end. The sticking I'm doing on this other machine here, these are both, by the way, small, um, the only one and a half horsepower shapers that I got from Grizzly back in the, oh, I want to say the early 80s somewhere. It would be better to have a stronger one, but that thing has got me by through almost, what, 40 years now? 80s, 90s, 
2000, 220, yeah, almost 40 years. All right, so it's done the job. But, all right, let's go take care of this other stuff.